here at the Drug Policy Alliance, I am the manager of Marijuana Law and Policy. Our Marijuana Law and Policy Unit is housed within our Office of Legal Affairs, which is here in Oakland, California. And I'm really responsible for kind of holding together the marijuana work of the organization. Uh, my background is as a marijuana academic, so I have a lot of knowledge, not of just about the plant and its use, but I've also been working with the industry for about 15 years. So I really am kind of the outward facing marijuana person, whether it's media or developing fact sheets or giving talks or meeting with interested parties from the industry or from the nonprofit world. Uh, that's really my role. Um, so I kind of take on a bunch of roles. I wear many, many hats, which is something that I prefer because I always have enjoyed occupations and jobs where I get to do something different every day. And that is absolutely the case with this job. So for example, this morning I had a meeting with media about stories that they're looking to do around the legalization of marijuana here in California. Um, but I also could be meeting with industry folks who are looking to give back to their communities and trying to figure out ways to do it. I could be meeting with nonprofit organizations that are trying to partner with cannabis organizations. I could be meeting with interested parties who are just curious about the whole cannabis movement and legalization and maybe think that they have something to contribute. So every day is a little bit different, and it's really all about moving marijuana policy forward in the United States. I mean, yes, marijuana is very exciting. I'm not going to lie, even though there are some days when I get home and I'm like, if I see one more marijuana plant. Um, but absolutely, it's an amazing time to be in this field. And when I started working in this field, marijuana was far from legal, and we had a really long way to go. So just to see it evolve in the way it has, you know, absolutely the content of what I'm doing definitely gives me passion. And when you're passionate about what you're doing, you're going to enjoy it. So, you know, they come out these lists all the time and, you know, really all they do is infuriate people that aren't on them. So I usually don't pay too much attention to them, but there was one and I, it was maybe five years ago, four years ago, um, or three years ago, it was L.com. And L.com, who, you know, not into cannabis, it's not like, like a cannabis industry rag or anything like that had listed, you know, like the top eight influential women in cannabis and kind of given us each a label, you know, like the media personality, you know, the, the entrepreneur and, you know, and it was some really interesting women. I mean, you know, women that are in the industry, but also women that are in media. And so, you know, it was an honor to be included in that list because I felt like it was more far reaching. But what really, I, what I loved about it the most was the name that they gave me, which was The Brain. And I think that was one of my proudest moments because, you know, to be featured in a magazine like Elle, which is, you know, primarily about beauty and, you know, kind of promoting the female in ways that maybe I have some problems with sometimes, but to be highlighted because of my intelligence and to be highlighted because of the contribution I've made academically and intellectually, I felt really proud about that because that's how I want to be seen. Um, you know, that's why I got into this. I got into this as an academic. And we all know that nobody knows who academics are. So I wasn't looking for any kind of recognition. I was really just looking to further the science. After conducting research and seeing that the policies weren't changing, um, that I needed to do more than just be the scientist, I decided to get into policy and to kind of be out in front talking about the research I'd done and talking about these things. But to be recognized as having that kind of contribution was something I, I really remember. I came to Berkeley in 2002 to start the PhD program in social welfare. I was very interested in looking at drug policy in general, especially its impact on poor people of color. This was what really propelled me uh, to have, be interested in drugs uh, as a study area in the first place, was understanding the racial disparities and institutional racism that existed in drug law. So I moved to Berkeley, actually to Oakland in 2002 to start the PhD program, and I became a medical cannabis patient because I was someone that believed in the therapeutic use of cannabis. So as I was doing my PhD studies, I started to visit dispensaries. And back in the early 2000s in the Bay Area, dispensaries were more than just pharmacies. They were holistic health, recreation, community center, camp type situations with artwork on the walls and marijuana plants growing everywhere. And they offered a whole host of services um, besides the cannabis, things like massage and acupuncture, free legal advice, but also entertainment like bingo and trivia nights, um, access to internet, access to food, um, access to free health care. 
So from a social work perspective, I became very interested in how dispensaries were operating as health service providers. Because what I saw was that the people that they were providing services to at 2 p.m. on a Wednesday were not individuals with really good, stable jobs and community support. They were individuals that really had typically been marginalized from other communities and were seeking more than just cannabis at these dispensaries, but were seeking social and medical support as well. So I decided to do my dissertation research on how these dispensaries were operating as health service providers. What were patients getting from this experience besides just the cannabis? And who were these patients? Were they healthy people? Were they people that were just like you and me? Or were they somehow different? And the thing is, back in 2002, 2003, we did not know anything about medical cannabis patients. Uh, so when I did my dissertation research in 2005 and collected data on 130 patients, that was the largest sample of medical cannabis patients in existence at that time, which really shows you how far we've come in just a decade or so. But what I found from this research was that indeed there was this social model of care that patients were benefiting from that was above and beyond just the provision of cannabis. Now unfortunately, since then, we've really seen a move among dispensaries towards a more business-centered pharmacy model. We've seen some of these services fall by the wayside to no fault of the dispensaries, but rules like the 280E tax provision that limits the deductions you can take for your business, the fact that dispensaries are zoned into smaller and smaller areas makes it really difficult for them to have these large health service models that we used to see. Now, how this still impacts my work today is that I still firmly believe in the dispensary as a neighborhood and community anchor. And I still firmly believe that it is an opportunity to bring people in who have been marginalized, typically from other arenas of healthcare and social care, and give them an opportunity not just to benefit from the therapies of cannabis, but to actually feel a sense of community. So this November, uh, Californians will be voting on Prop 64, which is an initiative to legalize uh, the adult use of cannabis for those 21 and over in California. It also calls for the state to establish a regulatory system to license the commercial cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, testing um, of regulated cannabis businesses. So similarly to other states like Colorado, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska, we would have a system of regulation for adult use. Now, as most folks know, California was the first state to pass medical marijuana back in 1996. However, for the past two decades, we have not had a state regulatory system for our medical cannabis program, which means that the only businesses that have been licensed have been a smattering of dispensaries around the state, mostly in the Bay Area. For the most part, for the past 20 years, the medical cannabis industry has grown very quickly in California, completely unlicensed and unregulated. Last year, Governor Brown signed the Medical Marijuana Regulation and Safety Act into law, which for the first time establishes a state-level regulation system for medical cannabis. This department will start issuing licenses in January of 2018. If Prop 64 passes, this is also the time that the state will start issuing licenses for adult use as well. For folks who say we need to wait and see what happens in Colorado, um, it's now been four years since we've legalized cannabis in Colorado, and so we have a pretty good idea of what isn't going to happen. Um, youth marijuana use in Colorado has actually gone down, um, as has ideas about how great marijuana is when we ask young people, so their idea of it being this really exciting thing has also gone down. Arrests have gone down by 90% in Colorado, and we've seen an amazing amount of revenue that has already started to go for programs like school construction. With any big policy change, it's going to be decades before we see the final results because anytime something is new and different, people act differently. And so it takes a few years for us to really understand how the change in policy is going to impact behavior. But there are a few markers that we can look for right away that would have given us a suggestion that maybe this wasn't such a great idea. For example, we would have seen people not show up to work. One of the big concerns was that people are gonna be stoned, they're gonna be lazy, they're not gonna have any motivation anymore. We didn't see that happen. Colorado, and especially Denver, continues to be one of the most desirable places to live in the country, so it hasn't hurt um, people having conferences there, people vacationing there, property values haven't gone down. We also didn't see an immediate increase in 
car crashes and DUIs related to cannabis. And we also didn't see an increase in other types of crime that people thought might happen because people were using too much cannabis. So we haven't seen a lot of the warning signs that opponents claim before we legalized, what we have seen as tax revenue. But that's one point. I think another really important point is that we don't have time to wait. And we don't have time to waste. There are about 13,000 felony arrests for marijuana in California every year, mostly on poor people of color. The longer we wait, the more arrests will happen. The more people will be saddled with lifelong barriers to employment, to housing, to childcare. And we can't afford to do this to our population anymore. We can't afford to have another part of the California population with the inability to be employed, with the inability to have stable housing, because that hurts us as an entire state. What's best for us as a state is to give people jobs, to generate revenue for schools, to generate revenue for dropout programs, for drug prevention, for substance abuse treatment. And these are all things that we'll get with legalization. And the final thing that I would say is that we already have an extremely robust marijuana industry in this state. Make no mistake, legalization is not going to introduce a new product to the 38 million people in California. We have an industry that precedes Prop 215 in 1996. Now is our opportunity to finally get it under control, to make it transparent, and to assure that it's being done in a safe manner. Well, it's interesting because I would say that any stigma I have felt around my own, you know, cannabis use has not come from family or friends. It's definitely come from like academic communities, um, you know, research communities. Uh, I, I happen to be an extremely fortunate person. I have a family that is extremely supportive and it's also part of the industry. My father is an investor. Um, he works with Canopy Boulder, and my brother is the pro premise manager at Spark in San Francisco. Um, so we're in it. Like, we're in it to win it as a family. You know, we, this is something that my parents have always been very comfortable talking about. My grandma is comfortable with it. My aunts and uncles at Thanksgiving, like half my family's on edibles. So it's something that I feel very fortunate that I, I don't have to deal with that. Um, I know other people who have been practically disowned from their families because of their work with cannabis, which I think is really unfortunate. But in my role as an academic and as my role as a researcher, that's where the stigma really comes. And it's, it's interesting because if I were a researcher who was studying child abuse and I showed up at an anti-child abuse rally, no one would ever say, oh, well, now her research must be completely subjective because obviously she's against child abuse, so her, we can't take her research seriously. But as somebody who's pro-cannabis legalization or somebody who outs myself as a cannabis consumer, for me, showing up at a pro-cannabis rally or a pro-legalization rally, all of my research is immediately called into question. And it's thought of, oh, it's subjective because, you know, she simply just wants to smoke pot, obviously. So the one experience I can really remember from that was when I was doing a postdoctoral fellowship at the Alcohol Research Group through the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley. Um, and I wanted to do a research study on cannabis use in the general population. I saw legalization coming. I thought it was really important. We do a piss poor job now of asking the general population about their cannabis consumption. So I wanted to pilot a survey similar to how we ask people about their alcohol consumption, which is way more in depth. So I got a great team of researchers together. I mean, just people who have blazed trails in the field of alcohol consumption research and cannabis research. I mean, I really did due diligence because I knew that my application would be really scrutinized. So I put together this grant application and I turned it in. And when I got the comments back, it got scored, but it didn't get funded. And the comments were on either side of the poll. One would say, this is the most amazing thing we've seen. We really need to fund this. I can't believe no one's done this. We really need to know this information. And for every one of those, there would be somebody that would say, are you kidding me? Have you looked at this woman's CV? Do you know what she's about? We can't give her money from the federal government. She's obviously pro-cannabis and really had nothing to do with the validity of the research. And that's one of the reasons I left research, because I realized that this area was so highly stigmatized and politicized that it's almost impossible to do any kind of non-prohibitionist work in this field and not be viewed as somebody whose research can't be taken seriously. The university isn't the problem. Uh, UC Berkeley has been nothing but unbelievably supportive of my work, um, of my research, of my teaching, of the fact that I do this job and then also teach there as well. I mean, they've been, they've been unbelievably wonderful. 
It's the federal government. It's the National Institute of Health. They're the ones that do the federal grants, and most researchers rely on federal grants in order to support themselves. So if you're going to be a researcher who can't get federal money, um, you're really shooting yourself in the foot. And that's where you have to make the decision. And am I going to study things that get federal money, like how marijuana is so bad, or am I going to go do something else? And I chose to go do something else. So if somebody is going into cannabis studies, and this is happening more and more, um, I get emails weekly about new academic programs that utilize cannabis knowledge. Um, I taught, have taught twice now a UC Berkeley extension course on medical cannabis that was a one-day course for people that are getting their um, alcohol and drug certifications. So for people that are getting into cannabis, whether it's academically or through the industry or as an advocate, I would say there's two things you have to do first. And if you don't do these two things, I don't want to see you come to any conferences, and I don't want to see you show up at anything, okay? First thing is you have to learn the history. You have to know who Dennis Perone is. You have to know how cannabis is connected to HIV, and you have to know why that's important. Um, you also have to know how, who Harry Anslinger is. You have to know that cannabis was made illegal to control Mexican immigrants. It had nothing to do with the plant. You have to know how we got where we are where this plant is deemed to have no medical use and to be extremely addictive in the eyes of our federal government because we didn't always think that way. And when I talk to audiences, I give them this great timeline where we start with 3000 BC, which is where we first found out about cannabis, to now. And if you look at the history of cannabis, from 3000 BC to 1937, when the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, cannabis was known as nothing but a medicine. There was no talk about, let's go get high. There was no talk about, oh, let's keep this away from kids. No, it was a medicine. It was something that was used to help people who were not feeling well. From 3000 BC to 1937. 1937, Cannabis Tax Act is passed. Now there's all this stigma around it. It's illegal. There's something wrong with it. From 1937 to 1996, when California passed Prop 215, cannabis was a dangerous, illegal substance with no medical value whatsoever. And then in 1996, we recognized it did have medical value. We started to turn it back around. So when you look at that grand scheme of things, its existence as an illegal recreational drug with no medical value is so small in comparison to our recognition of it as a medicine. And if you don't understand that and understand what was going on between 3000 BC and 1937 and then 1937 and 1996 and then what turned it around in 1996, you're not going to be successful. So that's the first thing. You have to know the history. And there's some amazing books. There's amazing documentaries. There's no well, there's a wealth of information about that. The second piece you need to understand is how marijuana prohibition has impacted vulnerable communities. So now that you know the green rush is starting and marijuana is legal, you see all these people who never would have associated themselves with marijuana under prohibition now showing up and wanting to take part in this. They do not understand what has been going on in communities as a result of marijuana prohibition. They have never experienced arrest. They've, never, they've been able to smoke pot wherever they've wanted to for a while now. So the idea that there's still this war going on and that these communities are still being impacted in this way is lost on a lot of folks entering the industry. So I feel that if you're going to get involved in this, come to the DPA website, drugpolicy.org. We have everything you will ever need to know about the war on drugs, who it's impacted, why it's impacted them, and what we need to do about it. And if you're not doing that, you shouldn't be part of the green rush. If we want to design a system of cannabis care that was reflective of what I saw in my dissertation, that I know is the most effective way to bring cannabis to communities that's going to take the most advantage of what it has to offer, we have to get where we came from. And we have to get that cannabis started in San Francisco because people who had AIDS had no place to go. And so they went to Dennis Perone's house so that they could get some cannabis, feel better, and so that people would talk to them and touch them and laugh with them and cry with them. So it's so much more than the cannabis. And the people that get that and understand that, they're going to be the ones who are still standing 40 years from now. I really believe that.
So one of the things in California is when you look at Proposition 64, it's going to be the first state, we will be the first state, that does not disallow people with drug felonies to become license holders in the industry and work in the industry. So in other states, if you have a drug felony, you cannot get a license to be a marijuana business owner. That will not be the case in California. And so on the state level, you know, we really want to look at inclusion opportunities and reducing barriers. So as I mentioned, you know, we have a two decades old robust cannabis industry in California. California. It's not happening in professional business environments. It's happening in people's kitchens and it's happening in people's backyards. And we have to recognize that these individuals may not be able to drop everything and go plunk down a down payment on a professional kitchen so that they can continue under legalization. That we're going to have to meet these folks where they're at and we're going to have to give them a pathway to compliance. And I'm really, really proud of the city of Oakland because the city of Oakland has always really embraced cannabis business, but recently they've taken it a step further by writing in an actual equity ordinance to go along with their medical cannabis regulations that not only recognizes the harms that marijuana prohibition has done to certain communities, but actually creates a program that gives these individuals priority when it comes to being business owners in the city of Oakland. Because when you look at the states that have legalized before, they are very homogeneous states when it comes to race. Um, Colorado, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, a lot of white folks. Right, a lot of white folks in those states. And now we're talking about California, which is one of the most diverse states in the country. And so when we look at, you know, who's going to be offered business opportunities, you know, of course, every state has a marijuana POWs. But California has a lot of POWs where it really has nothing to do with the marijuana. And so I think it's, it's a part of the psychology of policing and the psychology of race as much as it is equity in the industry. Because if we don't take advantage now and if we don't work really hard now to ensure equity through policy and through these regulations that are being written, I really fear that this industry is going to go the way of every other American industry and it's going to be marginalizing um, you know, people of color, um, especially people of color who have been formerly incarcerated. Method of ingestion is a really great topic area, and I actually do a whole class on it um, at the Women's Cancer Resource Center for women who have been recently diagnosed with cancer and are interested in using cannabis and really have no idea where to start. Um, you know, there are so many methods today, so I think your first question is going to be, do I want to get high? And if your answer is no, I should make a decision tree. That's how, you know, this is actually giving me a good idea, a decision tree of method of ingestion. Do, do I want to get high? If the answer is no, then your options are going to be either something that has a lot of CBD and not a lot of THC, and then you can ingest that in any me method you want and not feel psychoactive, or you can have something with THC but only put it on topically, right, because that's not going to break the blood-brain barrier. So if you don't want to get high, it's either a high CBD product or something that's not going to break the blood-brain barrier. If you answer that, yes, I do want to get high, um, then you're going to be looking for something that has THC and that is going to break the blood-brain barrier. Now, when I say get high, you know, that's really a broad term for feel the psychoactive effects of marijuana. Um, and this can be for any number of reasons. You're trying to sleep. You're trying to reduce your anxiety. You're trying to reduce your pain. You're trying to forget that you have pain. You're trying to make Sundays more enjoyable. You know, whatever that is. Um, if you're looking for that effect, then you're going to want something with THC in it. Now, among the things with THC in it, there's a lot of different options. Um, the ones we see most common are inhalation. That's my favorite. I'm an old school girl. I take bong hits of flowers. What can I say? Um, but inhalation, you feel it right away. So if you're looking to see how to titrate your dose, if you want to make sure you don't ingest too much, inhalation is a great way to do that. You feel the effect immediately. It also wears off fairly soon. So if you're not looking to be stoned all day, then you know something through inhalation is a good idea. With inhalation, we have smoking and we have vaporizing. Um, smoking is smoking. Uh, vaporizing is heating the plant material to a temperature that releases the active ingredients in a vapor without um, burning any of the plant matter. This is very popular nowadays. You see the vape pens um, that look very similar to e-cigarettes. Patients really like them because they're very discreet. Um, I've used mine at Disneyland. I have arthritis in my feet, so walking around Disneyland for seven hours is like a no-go with me, but if I have my vape pen, I'm able to do it. Um, so we see that discretion is very popular. Um, so that's inhalation. Um, and then there's the edibles. I also really like edibles because they give me long-term relief. And for somebody who has arthritis, I'm going to be mommy, on my feet all day. I can't necessarily step out and smoke during the day. Um, so edibles can be really helpful. 
The thing about edibles is that the dose-response relationship is completely different to that of inhalation. So with inhalation, you feel it right away, and then you come down right away. Edibles, it's a much slower onset, so it takes about 45 minutes to an hour, maybe more, for you to get at the peak effect. Once you're at the peak effect, you're there for a while. So if you're somebody that's not wanting to feel the intoxication for a sustained period of time, edibles probably aren't the right option for you. I will say that cannabis in whatever inhalation or edibles, whatever form you're taking it, is highly subjective to set and setting. And there's been sociological research on this by Howard Becker about people's experiences learning to get high the first time. But it's not like alcohol. Alcohol like hits you over the head with a sledgehammer. Like you're drunk. Like there's no doubt. Like after you have a few drinks, you're drunk. It doesn't matter if you're alone. It doesn't matter if it's the first time. It doesn't matter if you're at the office or the car or on vacation. You're feeling it. Um, but cannabis is different. And so someone may say that, you know what, I smoked the same amount of the same strain at two different times, in two different environments, two different sets of people, and the experience was totally different. And this is important to remember, especially with edibles, because what you don't want is to have an anxiety-related experience early on in your cannabis-using career, because cannabis is something people should have a good relationship with through their whole life. It's something that will be as if, if not more beneficial to you as a senior citizen, as it will be to you as a 20-something. So if you want to establish a good relationship, you want to pick methods of ingestion that are going to give you a good relationship with the plant, which means to take it slow, be mindful of your ingestion, be mindful of your intention, and really think about what you're trying to get out of the experience before you just mindlessly ingest something or smoke something or dab something. And if you do that and learn more about your own relationship with the plant, then you will really be able to maximize its benefits for decades to come. The one thing that keeps me up at night is that the people that have been most impacted by marijuana prohibition are going to be pushed out of the opportunities that are going to be available under legalization. And that we have such an opportunity here to see cannabis as this mechanism, not only for generating a lot of revenue, but for generating opportunity. And if we direct those opportunities and that revenue at the right communities, at the communities that need it the most, that are never subject to benefits when communities get benefits, if we start there, I really feel that cannabis can change the fabric of society. And I know that that sounds hyperbolic. <laughs> But I really feel that we, it, because there's so much potential for it as a commodity, that we can direct this money towards things that have been so underfunded and ignored for so long that we can really see real repair happen. And so I'm concerned that if we don't pay attention, enough attention to that now and just get so focused on the regulations and the industry and the money, that we're gonna turn around and those folks are not gonna be arrested, but they're not gonna be any better off and they're gonna be still have drug convictions and, and, and drug histories and legal histories and things that are gonna make it hard for them to be successful.